What's up, military millionaires? I'm your host, David Perret. Today we have an exciting, exciting episode about flipping meth houses and multifamily real estate with Jeremy Porto. If this is your first time listening. Thanks for joining the community. This podcast is produced every Friday for your enjoyment, and the show notes are found at frommilitarytomillionaire.com slash podcast. Now relax and enjoy the show. You're listening to the Military Millionaire Podcast, a show about real estate investing for the working class. Stay tuned as we explore ways to help you improve your finances, build wealth through real estate, and become a person that is worth knowing. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Dave here, and I'm here with Jeremy Porto, who is in the Air Force for nine years and has since gotten out and got into real estate and he was doing a video the other day with a buddy of ours and i saw a guy i know named phil capron who you may have noticed has been on the podcast before uh tagging me and was like you need to talk to this guy so we talked on the phone for a little bit and almost immediately i was like yep gotta get this guy on the podcast he's got a cool story so uh, i'm not gonna steal his thunder jeremy welcome uh tell us a little bit about yourself hey man thanks for having me on um yeah, I, I did uh, nine years in the Air Force, uh, was flying U-28s. Uh, at, towards the end of that, I started getting into, you know, s- single family stuff, some rentals, a little bit of flipping. And uh, one time I was deployed, hurt my back pretty bad. You know, years later, that played out into getting out. And uh, I was kind of forced to to take, uh, you know, what I learned early on and, you know, use it to, to live off of full time. And honestly, I... I absolutely love it. Um, you know, I was already passionate about real estate, um, and when I got out, it just gave me the opportunity to to spend full time in it. So, continued to do you know more flipping, more single family rentals. Started getting a little bit bigger, saying, "Hey, I think you know maybe maybe multifamily is is the way to go." But instead of taking that big step, I took a, a tiny step, wound up in you know four plexes, and which I absolutely love. I've got I still got several of those now, and and absolutely love the cash flow from them. Um, you know, buying rights important, and I was definitely able to do that there. Um, my wife is still active duty, so uh, she is now kind of driving the ship, and uh, I just kind of follow her around and learn the market that we're in. We spent uh, two and a half years in Colorado Springs, uh, which beautiful area out there. Yeah. Love that. Flipped a couple of meth houses out there because that's what was there. <laughs> nice. It was it was right as right as that market was was on its way up, and I was having trouble finding deals. It's mostly because I just didn't know the market well and wasn't really marketing myself in in four deals in a good way. So I wound up getting into flipping meth houses. Kind of became a semi meth expert, or maybe <laughs> meth remediation expert, not meth expert. Never did it. Never did it. <laughs> yeah. Just find some laying around like, oh man, I let's see what. <laughs> Yeah, I would no, not at all. Stale, stale meth is the best meth. <laughs> well, it's crazy. You don't even know it's there. Um, but that, that's something we could dive into. That that's that's some fun stuff to talk about. Um, and then finally, I've been making like the bigger step into multifamily. Um, bought thirteen unit apartment uh, last year. Um, working on an uh, an LOI on thirty six units. I've got a verbal commitment on the LOI. I just need to get it signed. Um, so I feel like I'm taking steps in the right direction and, and ultimately one day, you know, I'll be doing, you know, my goal is hundred plus and, and, and syndicating those deals. Um, cause you know, honestly with this 36 units, I'll probably be out of my own money for a little while. Um, and syndication will kind of become a necessity. Um, so that's where I'm at, you know, pushing forward into bigger stuff, uh, and, and syndication. That's exciting. Yeah. I am kind of in the same boat, like about a 10 unit and, I actually did. I bought a 40. Um, some stuff kind of went wrong. Uh, basically, the, it was a lease option. The guy didn't. The guy decided that the contract didn't exist, and so he didn't need to listen to anything that he had put on it and signed on it. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that came up anyway. So I ended up terminating the contract, and we're in a big legal battle right now where I'm like, no, 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 no. no. Here's what the contract said. You know, I, you're giving me my money back. Um, <clears throat> that being said, I'm at a point now where I'm like, yep, I either need to save for a long time or go into the syndication realm because kind of maxed out on what I can do 
out of my own pocket without just being like, you know, here I bought something and now build the reserves before something bad happens. <laughs> Um, yes. Yeah. And and I know that you are like me in that you couldn't wait. You couldn't just sit back and, and wait for it to build up before you do the next step. Like you got to be doing something. Otherwise, it's going to kill you. So uh, syndication is great. Part Any kind of partnering is, is great, I think. So I and I, I honestly, I, I learned about syndication not that long ago. Uh, and so I was of the mindset until not that long ago that, shoot, man, I got to buy something and wait for the money to build back up. I was taking money from my wife. I'm like, look, we're in this together. So give me all your money. <laughs> <laughs> I, You know, our, our finances are every, – every marriage runs their finances differently. But it's funny because we run ours fairly, like, split. And so I literally have a spreadsheet of what I owe her, <laughs> what I've taken from her, what I owe her back. That's but, um, awesome. I don't ever want to do that because it, <laughs> I, I have spending habits and my wife has saving habits and it'll eventually come out in the wash that like I talk about finances, but I'm the one buying the, you know, and it's all, they're all business related things, but I'm very quick to be like, okay, we have 600 bucks here. Ooh, I need a $400 microphone. <laughs> and she's like, yeah. Yeah, well, we don't need to buy shoes this month, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> But nice. Eh, teach their own. I, I'm lucky. My wife is pretty similar in my mindset. So honestly, we don't. I, I actually just convinced her to stop contributing to her TSP, which I'm very happy about. Um, and so, you know, she'll start banking that money a little bit faster. So not only, you know, syndication and, and partnering to, to keep going, but also I'm hoping that, you know, the money that she's been putting into TSP. And I would say that's maybe somewhat varsity level, you know, it, the young guys that are listening or that you know, consider all your options, you know, don't just say, you know, uh, somebody said not to contribute to your TSP, you know, talk to somebody first before you just do that. So, yeah, I have a, like a set number in my head that I'm like, okay, once I hit this number, then I'm done contributing. So I like, I'm at like 22% right now. Cause I'm like, I just got to hit that number and then I'm pulling it, you know, I'm done. And that's really less of a, I need the money in the TSP and more of a, I can't believe I did so bad with this thing the first eight years. So I'm just yeah. trying to get to something decent for all my time, um, which I should hit that number in the next, by the end of this year. And then I'll do the same for the last year I'm in. It'll just all go into real estate. Yeah. The, the, you know, they, they just did the dollar matching. Was it last couple of years or so? And yeah. ob obviously that's great. I mean, that's a hundred percent return day one. Yeah. Um, so any dollar matching you got to take advantage of, but beyond that i don't know you know it's in the stock market and it's you know you don't have control over it you don't have all the advantages of real estate um i, I just i don't want to be in the stock market you know any more than i have to yeah exactly i, I definitely prefer that and i had and i say this it's saying that i had stopped my tsp allotment for two years to dump it all into real estate i just recently was like man i'm gonna try to hit this number before i get out just so i have something to show for yeah really what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to get enough in the TSP, and this is probably the wrong way to play the game, but enough in the TSP that I can effectively use that as my reserves. So if so, I can I can feel comfortable dumping whatever because I know if something ever hits the fan, I can pull twenty grand out of this um, and pay it back that way. So like in my head, I'm like, okay, for one, they can use TSP and count it towards your reserves when you're purchasing. Um, yeah, but for two, I can take a loan out of it at, at an interest rate that I would never be able to get in the civilian world. So I'm like, okay, if I hit the, I think it's like 50 grand. I'm like, if I hit 50 grand, then I can pull 25,000 out, and I'll be able to, you know, keep it, and it'll count as 50 grand as my reserves for purchasing, which in my market is enough for basically anything up to a 25 unit property. So I'm like, okay, that'll be my plan there, and then I'll save everything else into. Um, so that's the only reason I'm building it up is like, okay, I know that I'm not going to blow this money. So it'll, it'll be a constant reserve. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also I, I have, I do have to say my wife and I have built up our TSPs and, and Roth IRAs to the point where they are sizable so that us stopping contributing is not like, you know, stopping contributing to a, to a, an account that has zero in it. We've, we've got a chunk there. So like you said, it could be used for reserves, you know, just net worth when it comes time for, you know, bigger loans that, that start looking at that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, very different situation. I, I hate to throw out a blanket statement, like stop yeah. contributing to your TSP and then see somebody use that in a wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh pros and cons to everything. Right. And there are, I mean, I, there are people out there who 
like liquidate the TSP completely to go into real estate. And I'm like, you know, good on you. I hope you don't buy something and the market crashes. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's not a bad play. I, I agree with it. Anyway, I digress. So let's hear about some meth houses. Yeah, that the, sounds the good fun. stories. Yeah, man, yeah. no one talks about meth houses. I, I fell into this. Uh, like I said, I, I, we moved to Colorado Springs. Um, we had, I mean, and just to put it in context, we had spent eight years in the Panhandle uh, in Fort Walton Beach, or at least I did. My wife kind of bounced around and back, bounced back and forth with me. And then that was when I had gotten out. So I knew that market inside out and backwards was, was doing just fine there. That's right when I got out. And then shortly after that, uh, she had a program that moved us to the east coast of Florida. Completely new market, um, Melbourne, Cocoa Beach area, about an hour east of Orlando. And I, man, I was just stuck in my way of, oh, I know that market, but I don't know this market, and I'm only going to be here a year. And I made all these excuses. Um, so I wound up actually still flipping in the panhandle uh, from Cocoa Beach. So I got a little experience, kind of the long distance thing, which is difficult. And I would never say don't do, but you know, if you can manage to, to work in your own backyard, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, yeah. so, so then from there, we moved to Colorado Springs. I had the same, you know, limiting mindset and, and saying, oh, I don't know this market. And, and I just happened to see on one of the auction sites pop up. It was a house. I was like, man, that's really cheap. What's going on? And I dug into it and it's a meth house. And I was like, oh, so, uh, and I, you know, this is not my personality to dig into something like that I have no clue about, but I just started calling around you know, got in touch with a guy that does meth remediation in like, I don't know, 40 or 41 of the 50 states. And uh, we just, I mean, we talked for like three hours on, on how to do it. And I swear after that three hours, I felt like I knew quite a bit about it. Um, but ultimately, you know, it, it, what I saw in the end from a, like a strategic, strategic view was meth houses are scary, like to, to the guy that doesn't know. It was to me when I first saw it. And, you know, it's this ghost or this thing that can't be, um, you know, figured out, but it's, it's a, it's a science issue. It's, it's a physical chemical that's on the wall. And when you clean it, it is no longer a safety hazard. Right. And so if you, if, you know, you follow all the rules, you get the right guys in to do the work. Then after that, it just becomes, you know, another uh, flip like anything else. It's just, you know, your budget's a lot bigger for renovation. So you got to have a lot more space. Um, and, and, that's how I got into it. And then I started doing, so I did that one. Then I saw another one. I, I grabbed that one. And, and I think because I knew, you know, what the numbers were and, and, and I wasn't scared of it. That second one that I got, um, I, I made my offer. The next guy below me, I wish I would have known this ahead of time was $50,000 below my Ooh. offer. Yeah. So obviously they were scared. They didn't know. And they were like, let's just throw a low ball out there, see if it sticks. Uh, but since I had, you know, I had the knowledge. I was able to come in with good. I still made great money on that deal. I made, I think it was 60 K on that one, um, flipping that one. So, um, and that was a lot of fun. I don't know if you want to know like all the details or some of the details on literally like, you know, how, how, it, how you test it, how you, how you clean I'm, it and all that. I'm curious if you've got a short, uh, debrief, that would be really cool to hear. I don't think I've ever okay. heard talk about that on a podcast. So it'll be something new. That's yeah. Funny. Um, the title of this episode is like, buy meth houses or I don't know. <laughs> Jeremy Porto does meth. No, definitely don't say that. <laughs> uh, does meth house flipping. But anyways, um, I mean the short, the short story, like I said, it's a physical chemical. So whether you smoke it or I don't, you know, whether you smoke it or whether you manufacture it, uh, the chemical gets on any surface, wall, ceiling, fans, in the ductwork, on the flooring, you know, wherever it is, it settles there and it builds up and it's a residue. Um, and they talk about it in uh, micrograms per square hundred centimeters. That's the kind of the basis for uh, knowing how much or how little there is. Um, and so, so, you know, the guys will come in there and test it by taking an alcohol swab of, of that hundred square centimeters, putting it in a, you know, a container and they send it off to the lab to test it. And, you know, uh, the safe limit, uh, and this depends on what state you're in. I was in Colorado. The safe limit is 0.5 micrograms of meth per 100 square centimeters. So if it's below that, it's considered safe. Um, and I know that seems a little scary that like, oh, so some amount of meth in my house is okay. But if you think about it, I mean, there's, you can Google this, I haven't, but <laughs> there's arsenic in our bodies, right? There's all kinds of, of uh, bad things in our bodies, but at the, at the appropriate level, it's not an issue. Same here. So, um, 
you know, I've seen numbers as high as 20, 40 micrograms per square hundred centimeters. So what is that like 80 times yeah. the, the legal limit? Right. And, and so depending on what room and, you know, the numbers that you see as to how much it's literal elbow grease. And I, this part, I don't know exactly, but they do use some kind of solvents and other chemicals to kind of get that stuff off and, and, and HEPA vacuums and all that stuff. Um, to eventually clean it to the point where they say, okay, we think this is good. Bring in the tester guy again. He retests the same way he did the first time. If it's under half a microgram per hundred square centimeters, you're good. And if not, you go back and you clean it again. Um, there's, there's a lot more nuance and, you know, did they paint over it? Did they, what kind of paint did they use over it? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And there's things you won't bother cleaning. Like you're not going to bother cleaning any, any fans, you know, any bathroom fans. That's where a lot of it gets, uh, accumulated because you know as the fans are blowing air that you know that all the air gets concentrated into that one area um, there's more nuance in that but that's honestly in a nutshell that's how it works this doesn't sound too bad is it is it some special kind of cleaner you got to bring in like i would imagine your normal house cleaner is probably not going to mess with that no uh, i i imagine the answer is yes i don't know the answer i brought in guys that were certified by colorado um, they're called industrial hygienists. They do their oh, thing, right. man. I, I stayed out of that piece of it. It is, I'll, I'll tell you one very interesting thing though. E, it is run on a state level, uh, remediation of meth. And so the EPA puts out a guideline on how to remediate a, you know, a, a meth affected home, but there is no like federal law as to how it's done. There are states, uh, I, I couldn't give you a name right off the bat, but there are states that don't have any guidelines on how to do this. Um, and to me, that's kind of Sounds- scary. Sounds like an Arkansas thing. They're, they're just <laughs> they're like everybody does a little meth. <laughs> yeah, I'm from there. And, say that. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Good. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to hate on any one state, but yeah. <laughs> we're like the meth um, capital of the world, apparently. Which, are you? Or at least we were when I was in high school. Funny you say that because uh, this is coming from I want to say it was like a New York Times article, but they they had some like heat map in El Paso County, which is Colorado Springs, was the number one county in America for meth affected homes. And I forget what year that was. I want to say that was the early 2000s. Um, I mean, yeah, it's there's, not there's a lot of it going on because Boulder's like the, you know, not very far away. And that's like the. <laughs> the hot spot for everyone who got strung out to go move to uh, apparently it's a big hipster place now and it's like got the, they've got the boulder iron man and it's turned around but i remember so my parents worked for campus group saved for christ and they worked for this organization called family life and every other year they go to colorado springs and they stay at um csu and they do a conference and so all through you know junior high high school we went up there every other year and i remember doing uh we went to boulder as like an outreach thing like to go talk to people and whatnot and i just remember like that was the trippiest place i'd ever been to that point in time and i remember like this guy sitting out there playing creedence clearwater revival on his car <laughs> and he's stoned out of his mind and he's like got his dog trying to trying to use his bong and it's like in public like he's just sitting there smoking out of a bong on the street and i'm like well this is not what i'm grew up around uh that's my impression of boulder but i hear it's uh yeah place now but (laughs) yeah i you know it's hard to say i think i think the incidences of meth are on the decline um I spent a lot of time talking to the Colorado Springs Police Department and and the the remediate I can't remember was it the Department of um I'll never remember it now but the Denver State Department that deals with this stuff it's it's in Denver uh, or sorry the Colorado State Department and then it's it's in Denver I spent a lot of time talking to those guys and they they had for a long time in the early two thousands um, spreadsheets that showed you know all the all, all the houses that they had you know that were meth affected and it trails off into the early uh, teens. And then they just don't even, well, it actually, the law changed and they, they're not allowed to keep a track of it now, but um, it seems like it has been on the decline, which I guess is good news. I think, so I 25 runs north South right through there, Pueblo, you know, from Mexico all the way up to like, you know, through Pueblo, Colorado Springs, Denver. And I think that's just a perfect, uh, you know, highway for traffic trafficking and whatnot. So, I don't know that that might play into it. Why that area is so bad? That actually, I just thought of an interesting question. So you got your first one off an auction site. Once you yeah. did it, and you were kind of comfortable with meth houses, was this something? Did you stick with auction sites, or were you able to like talk to the Colorado PD and find like a 
an in for like, hey, here's a meth house that might be coming to market or might be worth marketing to. So, that. sorry, Phen- a phenomenal question. I love it because that was my thought was, okay, I, I, I have expert knowledge now on something that probably not a lot of people do, right? And so if they're, if these houses are out there, I'm like the perfect person to sell this to. Um, and, and this was all right at the time when I was actually starting to get out of flipping. So I never took this to the, you know, the full completion, but yes, I, I was calling Colorado Springs police department. I was calling, um, you know, up in Denver and, and trying very hard to generate leads that way. Um, wound up not getting very far, but again, this is when I was kind of getting out of the flipping. So, so I didn't put a whole lot of effort into it just, just, just because I think it would be cool. Like if I had more time, I would love to go back and, and do that and play that out. But yeah, I mean, I started, so the meth remediators was the, the meth remediators and the industrial hygienists, the guys that were cl- uh, testing it. I tried making contact with all those guys in the state and saying, Hey, look, I live in El Paso County. You know, if you guys come across, cause really like one of the first people that find out are these guys, you know, you know, it's, if you're the owner and you know, it's affected, who do you call? You call the industrial hygienist. He comes out there and tests it and tells you, yes, you're meth affected. You need to do something about this. If I, I, my thought was, Hey, if I can get to these guys, as soon as they get, you know, tabs on a house that they just tested the, the initial assessment, they can send me the info and ask the owner, hey, can I put you in contact with a guy that, that does, you know, that remediates these homes? And I actually, uh, I got a lot of leads that way. Um, it, it's funny, this could be a whole nother story, but, you know, it, to bring this to a personal level, I talked to a lot of people that had this problem and it ranged from, I'm the one that did the meth in the house um, and now I got to clean it because I'm selling it goes from there all the way to, um, you know, my, my husband is the one that did it. Uh, and you know, I'm divorcing him and we're, we're having to sell the, the house. And, and then I go talk to the husband. No, my wife was the one that did it, you know? And then the wife's like, actually it wasn't the husband. It was, it was our son, our 18 year old son. Like the stories are, are, I mean, they're, they're crazy. And honestly, like they're sad. They're really sad. Yeah. Um, and then there's there, there's the ones that, you know, I didn't even know it was meth affected. Like I bought this, you know, 10 years ago and my raised my family here. And, and, you know, I just found out now when I'm trying to sell it that it's meth affected. Well, it turns out it was his son that did it. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's nobody wants crazy to stories. Admit it. Yeah. That's so, no, I, I definitely was, you know, where, where can I pull these leads from? I, I love that question because, you know, d- digging deep into something you're good at. Um, I, I think that that is definitely if I had stayed with flipping, that is definitely something I would have gotten farther into. Um, yeah, I, I like that question. In trouble with my cold calling. Like, does your house have meth? <laughs> <laughs> Just like, Hey, I heard your house was a, a you know, a fire hazard. Um, <laughs> you want to sell it dirt cheap? Cause you're going to jail. What? Like, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Though. That's funny. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, that's, I didn't, I wouldn't have thought about that. So the industrial hygienist is funny because, um, which is really funny because now as I'm looking at my uh, notes here, I really butchered the word hygienist, um, I, <laughs> hygienics. I don't know. Anyway. Um, no, spell it. Spell it so everyone knows. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Uh, but so I'm, I'm a safety rep out here for my unit, and those are the same guys we use to bring in to do all our safety inspections and stuff. So I should have known that that was – those guys do like every job that you could think like, wow wonder who does that. It's always them. Um, they have a really strange skill set, but they're great. Like they're the guys who come out and tell us like, Hmm, you're going to need a respirator for this. We're going to test all this. Now we're going to test all your people and make sure they're qualified to wear a respirator. And like, Oh wow. They do all kinds of crazy things that, you know, I, you would never know. I get to read the reports sometimes and it's like, they come up with hazards that you wouldn't have ever thought about. And they're the guys who do all the asbestos and lead treatments and testing. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're like the, you imagine like the guys who come in in movies that are like in full suits and come in and just like a bomb went off and we're going to clean everything. And they're like, eh, that's probably what they do. Well, it, to, that's exactly right. I mean, the, um, to, I, so I wanted to get myself, my name out there as the guy that did meth houses. So I called the, <laughs> the local news station. So and real estate people never <laughs> say. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I called the, the news station and said, hey, this – I mean, and, and this house that I was doing was in actually one of the very nice neighborhoods. So it was in, in a you know, shock value, Ooh, a meth house in, 
in in that area and and so they they jumped on it and and i said look the guys are going to be in respirators and white suits like this is great background you know footage while you're doing an interview come out at this time on this date and sure enough they did they interviewed me was on on the news and and I actually, I know, I, I only know of one true lead that came from that. I, I don't know how many more came that were not from that. Um, but that, but that was pretty cool. Um, I, I thought that, and that honestly, that'll work for anybody doing anything. If you've yeah. got a cool story that's newsworthy, that's free advertising. You know, it, maybe a, an article in the newspaper is less, uh, less advertising or not as, as great, but, um, getting a news story, that'll really get you out there. I, you know, my name, my face was out there and, and, um, that was that was pretty cool. Plus, it was just fun to be on the news. And that's what I need to do when my lawsuit's over: is just go and say, "Here, the store is nuts. Have fun." Um, yeah, yeah, that's a crazy story, but it's a good story. When I finally get to tell all the details, it'll be <laughs> it'll be great material. So you'll write uh, a book. Yeah, I don't know how to write a book on that, but I totally could. There's, I mean, shoot, I could just, if I just copied all the emails into a book, like, <laughs> um, that's probably about as big of a book. It took me like four days to go through and sort them out to mail them to my lawyer. But anyway, uh, all right, so you went from meth houses, which is, yeah. we probably talked about that for a while. It's really exciting. But um, what would you say? So you've done a little bit of flipping or a, a decent amount of flipping. You've done single family. You've done fourplex. You've done, now you're getting into the multifamily. So you've kind of done everything, it sounds like. Uh, the exception of maybe the Burr strategy, but that probably didn't exist when you first started flipping. So maybe you did it and just didn't call it the Burr strategy. Um, what, like, man, I'm trying to think of the best way to ask the question. Uh, I guess what what would like going back? Would you keep doing everything in the same order, or do you like? Do you think it's safe to try to jump into something bigger or? I don't really know where I'm going with that, but what no, you learned? That that's that's a great question. I, you know, when I was thinking about this podcast and kind of just reflecting on back what I, on what I've done, um, I, kind of the word that comes to mind is unfocused. Like it, you're right, I did a little bit of everything. I was buying county foreclosures to, um, you know what I mean. So it's it just kind of all over the place. And and I will say from the fun perspective, it's awesome. I have a little bit of experience in a lot of different things, so you know, those will play out later, I'm sure, and, and have like things that never would have related, um, you know, relate later. So I, I, I had a great time doing a bunch of different things, but I feel like it was unfocused. And, and so my, my future is to be focused in multifamily. Um, so can, can you jump straight into multifamily? I mean, the answer is most 100% yes. Is it, and, and I'm, I'm a full proponent of it. And yet I'm also one that started with a single family home bought a bunch of them then could only make the jump to fourplexes i couldn't i couldn't get beyond that for a while so i recognize there there is some fear there there's some you know unknown um you know my advice would be go the biggest that you feel comfortable going and and, and maybe not comfortable but go the biggest that you feel slightly uncomfortable going um because also uh, because i'll be honest you know if just from a pure financial perspective, if I had started in multifamily, I think I'd be much farther than I am now. Um, and so if you can, if you can get your mind around only a single family, then do it. Like just take that first step so that you can get started because once you become very familiar with single family, then you know what a duplex is doesn't seem so big anymore. And then once you do a duplex, a fourplex doesn't seem so big and on and on. I, when I first started, uh, thinking about like the bigger stuff, the hundred units, I would talk about a hundred units and I would go, Oh my God, I can't even say that. I just can't even fathom, you know, me buying a hundred unit complex. That feels very comfortable. What feels uncomfortable now, just because I've talked about it so much is 200 units, right? Oh, I couldn't see myself doing 200. 100 seems doable, but not 200. <laughs> no, I so think... no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, that's like the, not unfortunate, but the, the blessing in disguise for living in Hawaii is the sticker shock has like disappeared, which might get me in trouble someday. But when I lived in Missouri and I was a recruiter there and I first started buying in houses, like my duplex was $81,000, you know? And, and so buying a $200,000 property would have seemed like, Ooh, you know, and I remember buying my 10 unit and I got it. I mean, when you compare it to other uh, areas, like I got this thing for a, a steal, right? It was under a quarter mil for 10 unit. Um, and that seemed kind of like a big jump because it was 10 units and it was still a decent chunk of change and this, yeah. um, and then I moved to Hawaii. Well, I bought that while I was in Hawaii, but I moved to Hawaii and 
you know, a three bed, one and a half bath, 1100 square foot, hasn't been renovated in 40 years house on an eighth of an acre is 750,000. Uh, that's what I was going to say. The, the median home price right now is like 825, 850. Like you just can't touch it unless you're living in a bad area of town with a VA loan. Um, so going back now, like I'm looking at San Diego prices. I'm like, oh, that's actually pretty affordable for like a 450,000. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, that's going to get me in trouble. So, okay. But like when I look in Missouri, like it's, it's funny now because I look and I'm like, I can buy a house for how much? Like, is it even worth buying at that price? You know, it is <laughs> like the, the mind change, which is good as I start getting into bigger properties because, you know, $40,000 a unit, $35,000 a unit is like, whatever. That's great <laughs> um, compared to $200,000 a unit out here. So I don't know. I can understand why, but you're the first person I've ever heard say San Diego real estate prices are reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mind you, I'm not buying there. So I, I know. I oh, yeah. Out yeah. Of it, but it's just the sticker shock is gone, which is yeah nice. So that Man. fear can get in the way. Is that pricing in Hawaii just because it's an island and, you know, there's just, you know, it's hard to expand? Why is it that way? So there's a lot of variables. Yeah, one is uh, there's a lot of money that comes in here. I mean, China, Japan, um, everybody who wants to retire on the mainland is like, ooh, Hawaii, Ho Oahu. Um, but because Oahu is so overpopulated, they are starting to run into, I mean, there is not much land left. So yeah. <clears throat> people are having to build up and people are having to build, you know, in-law suites on their property for their family to live in. Um there's a lot of other reasons. I mean, the, the, oh, what do they call it? The salary for, to be considered like not poor, but um, I can't remember the poverty nice. line. Yeah. It's like $90,000 here. Oh, it's like, it's like 80 something, 90 something. I can't remember the exact wow. number, but it's, it's up there where I'm like, that's poverty. Um, <laughs> that's living like a King in the Midwest. Yeah. Uh, and so, and it's just, I mean, that won't, you won't get a house. Like, my housing allowance out here, I think the only county that's more expensive is San Francisco right now. And my housing allowance is like $3,200. And, and that won't buy a house. Um, there's a few markets. I mean, it's possible. There's some places it'll work. But if I was to try to buy right out the gate in Kailua, which is kind of turned into like, you know, kind of turned over into hipster world uh, where it's getting pretty cool now. Um, yeah, I won't touch it. I mean, my mortgage will be four grand. Uh, and it's just, that's just the way it is because people are throwing money in and the price is going up. And the other thing is it's an, when Oh nine hit Oh eight Oh nine and the market like crashed, the Hawaii market mm -hmm. was like this it was like, blip. <laughs> so people feel like, Oh, it's never going to go down because land is, and that's what it is. It's really weird. Cause like the, you'll look at tax stuff here and it'll be like home value, $110,000 you know, land value, $700,000. And you're like, uh, that's an eighth of an acre, you know, um, or a quarter geez. of an acre. Uh, and that's where it's at is they're running out of land. There's a lot of protected land and there's a lot of uh, like Hawaiian homeland where you have to be true blood Hawaiian. To, um, it's like on a lease option. Uh, wow. Like, like a, a hundred year lease where, you know, you can buy the place. That's great, but uh, you're not getting the land. And so buying actual land out here is, it's, it's a mess, but some of the other islands aren't so bad. So Maui is the same size as Oahu with a third of the population. And so it's still expensive, but it's, you know, like San Diego expensive, not like, holy crap, I can't believe that expensive. Um, yeah. Yeah. My, my sister's a NCIS agent and she was out there for, I think like two, two and a half years, went out and visited her and I saw her apartment, you know, nice apartment, but she told me how much she was paying in rent and I was just blown away. I, I could, I could not understand it. <laughs> I like, can, I, can somebody invest in, in Hawaii? I mean, the answer is yes, I'm sure. But like, I mean, does it make sense there? Like what kind of investing in Hawaii makes sense? Flipping. If, flip it yeah okay so the market the market's kind of slowed a little bit um but i mean you can the spread out here is huge I, I mean guys will buy you know a house for 400 grand put 100 into it and be able to sell it for nine um Jeez. I, I, I have okay. a buddy i have a buddy out here <clears throat> did over 25 flips last year and won't touch a flip if he's not going to make six figures in profit wow and so on that side, I mean, that game is, is big. There's a lot of room for, 
uh, forced depreciation out here. If you find, I mean, if you found a meth house out here, you could get it, you could get it for three or 400 grand. If it's in the right neighborhood, you can flip it for 1.2 and it'll sell. And that's the real crazy thing is it's kind of slowed a little bit right now. Um, almost to like normal market uh, as far as sales. But when I got out here, if a house was not under contract two days after the first open house, they were debating like moving the price down. Um, Cause Jeez. I remember like they'd have a broker's open on Thursday and sometimes it wouldn't make it to Sunday, but then they'd have the open on Sunday and they would literally have like four or five offers on their table the next day and the house would be off the market. Um, it was very rare to see a house. I think the median home sale price was less than two weeks. I mean, it's just insane. And so you Man. can just flip a house and be done. Um, and so it's just a it's just a strange market. So that's a good play. I have a buddy who I need to I've been trying to get on the podcast. He's not super big into like video and and whatnot. He's, <laughs> he kind of prefers to be anonymous, I think. I'm I'm working it. Um good friend. He's probably going to listen to this and be like, "I know who you're talking about me. Why would you say that?" Um, but I'm not going to say his name, so it's all good. This is the <laughs> only person I've met who has found a way to like legitimately cash flow. Now you can cash flow Right, you can always cash flow, but I mean, people will call it cash flow because it's making money. And I'm like, you bought an eight hundred thousand dollar property and you're making two hundred bucks a month. Like, yeah, that's cash flow, but my bank account, my savings account, is making me a better return. Um, yeah. But he bought a, he found a way to like, he got the VA loan to approve. They jokingly call it the monster house, but it's it's like a six unit property that, I mean, it's. Like the way he bought it, it was, you know, they were kitchenettes, not kitchens and this, that, and the other. And he basically had, he's like basically running a hotel, um, like a, an Airbnb hotel out of his place. And he's making great money. Um, and he's like the only person I think I've found that I would legitimately say, yep, he made it work and he made it work very well. Most people, I mean, if you bought three years ago, you'd have some appreciation, but that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, man. And, and Airbnb was kind of my next thought. I, I don't know what the market is for that out there. I don't know how often you get people kind of coming in. I mean, it's a great vacation spot, right? I, I, but I don't, I just don't know. But Airbnb, Airbnb seems is, like maybe the way. Yeah, it, well, <clears throat> it, it, it's too good. Uh, they are very heavily regulating. Um, ah, okay. So depending on your zoning, it might be approved. But if you get caught in the wrong zone the first time, it's like a $16,000 fine. <laughs> So oh, um, they are really trying to crack down on people just Airbnb all over the place. So if you okay. get in the right zoning, I mean, I, I know people who made a lot of money last year on it because you're right. I mean, they just, they are always full. There's never vacancies. Um, it's just finding the right zoning to do it and then being able to purchase. So, yeah. Huh. But, okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so let's roll into some of these questions that I never get to. Uh, <laughs> All right. So the first one I like to ask is if an E1, E2 or you know, 18, 19, whatever, uh, walked up to you asking for advice, and you only had a few minutes to give them, what would your best tip be? Yeah, it, definitely just get started because I, cause take action, do something because so many people I talk to that desperately want to be in, in real estate or, or doing something other than what they're doing. And they're just too scared to take that first step. I don't have, and, and there's excuses and I've been there. I did it myself. You know what I mean? But no money is not an excuse. Um, no experience is not an excuse. Um, if, if your first step is to just go educate yourself, that's, that's an action step, right? Go read a book, go listen to podcasts. Um, and, and, you know, if, if no money is the issue, then get into the creative stuff. You know what I mean? Get, get into the off market deals through direct mail, which, I mean, it does cost, but it's small. And if you can find lease options and subject twos, great ways to get into places with very little money. Um, and if you don't literally have, if you literally have zero, you know, find somebody that's got some money and then it, it execute these creative deals. But just do something to get started and every day take a step forward. I don't mean to deviate too much, but I, I was chatting with this one woman at a multifamily conference and um, the that conference was preaching like, you know, you don't have to start with single family. You can jump right into multifamily, you know, and here's how. And, and I was talking to this girl and she was just like, I, I can't do it. It's too big. I'm like, why are you here then? Like, you know, then, you know, do something like I, and I kept telling her, I was like, this is not what they're going to preach to you. But if you can't see yourself going big, get, just go get a single family, get a condo, something small, whatever. Do something. Do something. I agree. Call me. Call me. <laughs> I'll talk to you. I'll, I'll kick your butt. 
yeah, I want to, I need to learn more of the ins and outs of syndication because I want to eventually get into that. Although I also want to burn some houses because that just seems like fun. Um, buying a multifamily is, man, I don't want to say it's boring, but like, like my 10 unit was like the lamest purchase ever. It was like, okay, <laughs> purchase this place, evict this guy. And now it's like this steady stream of income that doesn't, you know, knock on wood, doesn't have any issues, which, which is great. And that's how it's supposed to be. But my duplex was more more fun because it's like, okay, first I live in it. Now I don't. Now I got these trashy tenants. I got to do this. Now I got to fix this. I got to rehab this. I got to renovate this. Let me get new floor. Let me do that. You know, it's like, oh, I got all these cool pictures out of it. Um, and the house flip I partnered on was the same way. But I'm like, man, multifamily is not as, like, it's thrilling in its own way. But, like, the actual, like, process, unless you get, like, a trashed multifamily, it's kind of boring compared to, like, flipping houses. I was I was thinking about that this morning, and I was like, you know what? When when I'm big in multifamily and things are going smooth, I'm actually going to go backwards and go go do some wholesaling just because it's fun, because I enjoy it, because I enjoy getting those phone calls, uh, you know, from from people calling me off my direct mail. I, I have fun with that, right? Yeah. Um. That that's that's a funny that's a funny thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. So what is? And I ask this, and this question always backfires on me. So let me preface by saying I'm not telling, I'm not expecting the military to teach me finances. Um, <laughs> but what is one thing you wish the military had taught you about real estate or finances earlier in your career? If I had learned about house hacking with a VA loan earlier, before I had a wife that didn't want to, <laughs> that 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 that's what I would have liked to have seen. I mean, the VA loan is an opportunity that only military people have, um, and and they they put it out there quite a bit, but they don't put it out there in a way that's really usable. They, you know, probably what you see a lot of guys doing is, oh, I I know about this VA loan. I'm going to go buy this giant home for me and and my wife, and that's it. And then we, and then really like we got into a home maybe we shouldn't have. We have zero in it, so it's kind of a little bit you know, risky. Um, why, why doesn't the military take that same VA loan and tell people how to house hack, go buy a duplex, a triplex, a quad and, and make money on this phenomenal tool that we have. I, I wish I'd have known that. I, I was very close to house hacking a duplex. Ironically, that one had Chinese drywall in it. Um, <laughs> but ultimately I never moved in, but I, I really wanted to. And, and the, the decision came down to just family and I, cause I, I was just too far along in, in, you know, my family life, it, it was just me and my wife, we had dogs, but it just didn't make sense at the time. But, you know, had I, had I known that earlier, 100%, I would have, I would have done that. I think that's a good one. Um, Cause I agree. The VA loan is, it's not widely understood um, and it's not discussed enough because so many people just like, I got talked out of the VA loan. Uh, when I bought my duplex, I ended up using an FHA cause the VA specialist realtor lender guy, um, didn't know enough about it and knew more about the FHA and like kind of talked me out of it, tried to, you know, apparently I was under the impression I could only use the VA loan once. And, um, it was like, don't waste it on this. And now I'm stuck paying 80 bucks a month in private mortgage insurance that I would not be paying had I used the VA loan. And I'm like, I can't ever go back and relive in the house again, or I'm not going to, um, you know, what's even crazier. And this is something that just came about recently. So a lot of people don't know this is out there, but you know, the FHA, the two or three K loan, so the yeah. VA came out with a renovation loan and the first year they did it, they had like a $30,000 cap on renovation um, and they have since approved it and it is like nuts. I mean, you can buy a That's property. That's out there now. Yeah. And you can buy a property with a 1.5 million ARV and buy it for, I think it's like 1.5 million is the cap for purchase. If you put, you know, I mean, obviously you got to put a lot of your own money in because you can only go past the local cap rate. Um, before you had to put percentages down, but like they'll renovate anything. I mean, you could, you could buy a, you know, tear down quality fourplex and Man. have it renovated by professionals before you moved in and do uh, I mean, that's the one downside is you can't do the renovations yourself, yeah. but it's still essentially like a live in flip cause you just moved in then. And when you're done, you sell it. And if you can do that and find the equity spread, you're basically flipping a house to move in yourself and enjoy. And then you, leave um that's huge and i can't wait like i'm waiting when i go back to missouri i'm like i'm gonna find a fourplex that caught on fire and because <laughs> I, I had one uh two years ago when i bought the 10 unit uh someone called me off a of direct mail they had a fourplex that had like a unit had burned and they were just trying to offload it and i ended up getting the 10plex off the direct mail so i went with that 
Uh, but I'm like, man, if I can find that again, like move right in, I'll move into the burned out unit, you know, whatever, and just renovate it with the loan, move in and have it for a year and move out and be cash flowing like a king. That's great. I, I didn't know that existed. Is there, is there a special name for it or something? I'm going to Google this later. Uh, it's literally just like the VA renovation loan. I can, uh, if you can't find okay. anything on Google, uh, I'll cook, hook you up with my guy out here in Hawaii who's been doing it. I mean, and that's how you know it's a solid deal is people have been using it out here. Um, yeah. So buy a house out here and get it renovated with the loan. Like it'll cover a decent chunk of change. Um, but I have a video on it, so I'll, I'll send you an email. Definitely. Definitely. That's cool. Information Cause he knows a lot more about it than I do, but yeah, it's super awesome deal. Um, hmm. so what makes the Jeremy Porto method of investing unique or successful? Uh, I don't know. Cause I'm crazy. and <laughs> I'll do anything. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, it, it, I mean, that's my answer actually. And I'll just like make it a little more well said, but uh, honestly just, you know, not letting something scare me. Um, you know, being willing to learn. It's not my strength, I'll be honest, but since I've been willing to do that, that's how I got into meth houses. I, I didn't, we didn't talk about it, but the very first flip I did was a Chinese drywall house, a duplex. Um, and so, you know, it got, you know, I did county foreclosures for the first time after never, you know, didn't learn about it, learned about it as I was doing it. I don't recommend that, but, um, you know, just being willing to try anything and, and, and learn anything. If you don't know it, go find it, go find out. Um, you know, don't let your lack of knowledge uh, be an excuse to not do something. I am going to ask because we've now mentioned it twice. So could you expound <laughs> for the listeners what the drywall is? Because I'm sure some of them don't know. You know, so I, I think that this is kind of going away. People don't understand it anymore because it, it was kind of a one-time thing. My understanding is back when Katrina hit uh, the southeast um, and there were several other hurricanes that hit in that same time period, um, there was just a massive need for drywall. I'm sure a lot of building material, right, to rebuild. Um, so we started importing Chinese drywall uh, to fill that need. And uh, this part I don't know, but you know something with the manufacturing technique, maybe something to do with the heat and humidity in the southeast. But the, the drywall that was imported from China was leaching uh, sulfurous compounds. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but it was just leaching some kind of um, you know, chemical that was making people sick. They were getting nosebleeds and headaches. And the good news is it wasn't, as far as I know, it wasn't anything that was like long-term. If you left it, if you left the house, you know, you know, the stuff went away and it was done, but you can't live there. Right. And so the only remedy is to literally tear out all the drywall and start over again. Um, same thing, kind of scary at first, but when you realize just remove the drywall, there's not even like a cleanup. It's not like you have to like clean the tile when you're done, right? It's literally just remove it. It'll stop leaching the compounds and that's that. There was a little bit more to it. Like it would, it would corrode copper more. So you had to be careful with uh, plumbing and, and the copper coils and the ACs. But um, for the most part, it was just remove the stuff and it was done. And, and so that's why I'm saying. I don't think it's around anymore because, you know, that need, that massive need for um, drywall is gone and we're not importing from China anymore, at least that I know of. Uh, so I, I think it's kind of, it ran its course and I think people don't really know about it anymore. That was 2000, like five, six, seven ish. I think the China was probably like mixing arsenic into their wood. Like, ha, look at this. They'll never suspect this kind of terrorism. <laughs> yeah. Th this was probably planned. Yes. <laughs> and there were microchips in the drywall. CS gas or something. People are just in there getting like gassed. Terrible. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, yeah. I had n I had actually never heard that. I was assuming that that was like some code word for like asbestos or uh, lead, but it sounds like it was actually way less miserable. You all know about lead poisoning from like thirty years later. Yeah. Oh yeah. Take take Wikipedia for what it is, but if you if you go if you go on Wikipedia, there's a decent article about Chinese drywall there. At least give you the basics. Sounds good. All right. So the last question I always ask is. What's one resource, book, website, course, whatever that you would recommend to anyone getting started in real estate investing? I hate, I hate, oh, started in real estate. I hate, I hate saying what everybody else has said. And I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not creative. I can't come up with any new. So I will, I will change your question a little bit if okay. I can. I'll yeah, take absolutely. Some creative license here. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, it's called Nudge by Richard Thaler. And the reason I, it's, it's nothing to do with real estate directly the reason i like it is uh it's about human biases and uh, the words he uses choice architecture you know and i think from a sales perspective 
it doesn't draw the exact uh, you know lines from the book to how to how to use it in sales. There's no direct application that he goes to, but it talks about human biases and, and the ways we think. And when you frame things a certain way, the the outcomes, you know, the thing, the way you think about it is very different. We could use that. We're in sales, you know. Anybody in real estate, it's marketing and sales, and we can use this stuff to our advantage. Um, so I don't think you'll see anything in there about real estate. It's it's more a uh, behavioral economics type book. Um, but all that stuff, I mean, how humans work, how humans think, they, I mean, that's crucial to negotiating a deal, right? Getting something under contract. Um, and so I, I love that book, Nudge by Richard yeah. Taylor and Cass Sunstein. I'm going to check that out. That sounds good. I like I like that kind of stuff. Um, and I have yeah. a, buddy, a buddy who may may like that. I'm on this like mission to give him a book recommendation that he likes because he's such a prick when it comes to books. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I could, I could give you the real estate books, but you've probably heard them already. They're all, you know, everybody, you know, rich dad, poor dad, that's the obvious. Yeah. And, you know, you, you hear the normal slew of other books. So I, I can't be like everybody else. I got to be a little different. No, I would, I like that. I, I like asking the question because I hope, you know, I like to hear something new. And, you know, when you read as much as, or, or audio book as much as some of us do, it becomes like, okay, yeah, that's a good one. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And it's like, increasingly rare to hear oh i don't know what that's about tell me about that so i appreciate it yeah certainly um, before we wrap things up is there any uh like parting words of wisdom or advice or ideas that you'd like to chat about um insert insert smart thing here i i, <laughs> I not, not really i i uh Maybe just say that it, you got to be passionate about what you do. I, I love this stuff. You know, I, I'm happy to talk with anybody, uh, any of my buddy. I, I mean, I've got friends that I didn't know them before, but we started talking about real estate, and and that's how we developed our friendship. Um, you know, develop that that passion. And if it's not about real estate, then you know maybe real estate's not the thing for you. But go find out what is. Um, you know, the, why do we do this stuff? We do it to be happy, right? To, to enjoy our lives. Um, some of that's through, you know, wealth creation so that we can do the things that we want to do. But wouldn't it be great if, if, you know, getting to that wealth was, was enjoyable for me, it is for you. It is, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, find that passion, find that thing that you love, do that, find a way to monetize that. Yeah. Right on, right on. I like it. Um, let's see. That was smart. Um, okay. and then, oh, and then we could we could throw this out there to make us seem cool, and you could tell everyone what your headset's from. <laughs> I do not play any video games at all, never, ever. Um, but my thirteen-year-old nephew plays a lot of Fortnite, oh, okay. and my bro, my brother plays a lot of Fortnite. Well, did, and I was like, you know, all right, I'll play Fortnite. And so I got, I, I literally bought a PS4 to be able to play the game. I bought. I, I didn't. You didn't have to buy Fortnite, and then I bought this headset for Fortnite because uh, my one-year-old at the time was too loud and I couldn't hear what I was, what I was saying. So, yeah, this is a head a headset I use for Fortnite. Yeah, <laughs> that, so makes, you, that makes me cool well, with the thirteen-year-olds. That the yeah, all those thirteen-year-olds right, out there listening to this. <laughs> maybe Ninja think I'm cool. watch my podcast now. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> doubtful. Uh, he's too <laughs> playing like fourteen hours a day of whatever. Um, right, my so nephew claims that he killed him, by the way, once in a game. So oh, yeah. I don't know if it's true, but he says he did. I mean, I'm, if you play that much, I'm sure somebody's got to kill you eventually, right? Ninja, you got to come on this podcast and defend your honor right now. <laughs> oh, man. I saw a really funny – this is totally not – I guess it's not off topic anymore because we went there. Um, a funny picture yesterday and showed up on my Instagram, and it was uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines with uh, Ninja in the middle – <laughs> and it was like, you know, and Chip has like 4.4 million followers and, and Ninja has 3 million something. They're both huge on Instagram. Um, but Chip posted the picture and the caption was something like, you know, so great to meet you. Tell your grandma who I am because it'll earn you massive cool points if you don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and I just thought that was funny because I was like, that is a very generational, like, you know, he could have legitimately grown up and had no idea who they were, but they're they're rock stars and everybody knows them. But that's funny. Anyway, um, all right. So, where can people get a hold of you if they have questions or they want to reach out? Yeah, uh, my website is blueridgeinvestmentpartners.com. Long, but it but it's the company name, so easy to remember. Blueridgeinvestmentpartners.com. And uh, you can just go on there, kind of peruse what I'm doing in multifamily, and and uh, there's there's my contact information's on there. You can reach out to me there. Awesome. 
That's perfect. I will make sure that I plug that in the show. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you, man. I, I really enjoyed it. Hey, thank you for listening to another episode about my journey from Military to Millionaire. If you liked it, be sure to visit from military to millionaire.com slash podcast to subscribe to future podcasts. While you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show. Give us a review on iTunes. Now get out there and take some action.